Welcome to Shadow of Truth with your host, Dave Kranzler from InvestmentResearchDynamics.com. And my name is Rory, and I'm with TheDailyCoin.org. And we are going to get into the non-farm payroll and the, announce, or the announcement from the Chinese that they are wanting to make the yuan or the renminbi the uh, world reserve currency backed by gold. And Dave, why don't you run with that, with the non-farm payroll, and what's on your mind with that? Well, once again, I kind of expected the government to, to release a nonsense BS number, but the, the degree to which this number is just patently absurd blows even my mind. Now, they're, they're, if you look at the headline reports, and these are, mind you, these are the headline reports that all of financial TV media will be talking about today. Two numbers, 295,000 and 5.5%. That's the only numbers that are going to be parroted thousands of times all day long on Bloomberg, Fox, and CNBC and CNN. And then people are going to people who bother watching the news at night are going to hear about 295,000 jobs and 5.5% unemployment tonight. And then tomorrow, people who bother to read the newspaper anymore are going to see those numbers in their morning newspaper. And they are a complete and utter fraudulent farce. It's a joke. It's almost like I wonder if these guys are laughing when they put these numbers together before they release them. Well, I hope they are. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, how, well, how much longer do you think, Dave, is going to be before the unemployment rate uh, drops to, I don't know, 1.5 or 0.5? I don't know. It's, it's interesting. Um, who knows? I mean, who, who really knows? But if really all you need to look at when you're looking at the employment report, I used to look at the birth death model, and a lot of people look at that, and I'm not even sure that that's necessarily relevant, whether you add that in or subtract that from the number, because who knows how they come up with that number. But they have a report, it's, it's, also, it's in their very same employment report that are used to derive the, the, these headlines, the 295 and the 5.5, and it's, it's the household survey, and it's, 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 it's Probably in terms of how they gather the statistics, it's a little, it's more accurate than than the 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 other survey that they use to produce the 295 and the 5.5 percent. Now on that one, it shows the the civilian non-institutional population. It shows the month-to-month -month change in that category, and that's essentially what's known as the working age population. It's so everyone between the ages of I believe it's 16 and 65. So the working age population according to the government increased from January to February by 176,000. Okay now um, the next number that's relevant here is the civilian labor force. Now the civilian labor force is defined as those who are working plus those who are looking for a job. And that number has been redefined over the years through the last three or four presidential administrations. They, they've, they've made it so that it's, it's, it's less and less of a portrayal of, of the actual size of the labor force. Um, they, they've tightened it down so that, it, you know, essentially they measure those who are looking for a job as, as those who are, who are getting unemployment benefits and maybe a few others who when they pick up the phone call and the and the Bureau of Labor Statistics is is surveying them they say yeah I'm looking for a job so that's that's your it's it's the number of people employed plus the number of people quote unquote looking for a job now that number declined by 178,000 so 178,000 people left the labor force while at the same time the civilian non-institutional population, the working age population grew by 176,000. So the labor force participation rate declined once again to 62.8%. We haven't seen that level of labor participation rate that low since like 1977. This is the definition of an employment depression. 
because that number was close to 70% when it, when it peaked. I think it peaked like in the early 90s. Okay. And then again, according to the government's own household, the, the government's own numbers in the household survey, the number of people employed increased by 95,000. But the number of people not in the labor force decreased by 354,000. Goodness gracious. Yes. So where they, where they get that 295,000 number is they basically do a bunch of statistical mumbo jumbo to, to their data. And, and they, yeah, I mean, you probably had people, you know, they probably measure people who actually found jobs during the month of February. Well, what about the people who lost their jobs? And what about the number of people who actually left the labor force? That number is over 300 and what did I say? 350, 354,000. Which is a that lot number lot. is not reflected in the headline statistic, and it's certainly not reflected in the unemployment rate. If you go by John Williams, the shadow statistics guy, and I, I believe his definition of unemployment is the way that the government calculated the unemployment rate in 1990. Okay, remember I, I, I mentioned that they've redefined how they, how they calculate the size of the labor force over the years. Well, if you actually take the way they calculated it in 1990, the unemployment rate is, is over 20%. Which is close, which is very close to the Great Depression numbers. Because I think it, it peaked at like 27, didn't it? 27. I, I don't, yeah, something like that. Yeah, that, that's, that's where we are. So, and that, that's why you're seeing things like, you know, the number of people on welfare going up every year. Um, the number of people on Social Security disability has gone up every year since, since Obama took office. Well, really, it's gone up more, you know, since before that, but it really accelerated starting in 2008. Well, a lot of those people can work. It's just that they've used lawyers who have found loopholes in the, in the regulations, and, and the lawyers have gotten them onto the Social Security disability payroll. And so they're, they're getting paid to not work. And guess what? The legal fees get paid by the taxpayer. If you use a lawyer to go on Social Security disability and you win, your legal fees are paid by the taxpayer. Now, the, these numbers just are not consistent with, go, with what's going on in the real economy. We know the oil sector has lost tens of thousands of jobs in February alone, even more if you, you know, since, since December and, and November. Um, Hewlett Packard just announced 54,000 job cuts. IBM announced is cutting over 100,000. Now, those are globally, those are numbers globally, but a lot of those jobs are going to be in this country. You've got retailers going bankrupt almost every day, yep. and yet the government's telling us that the retail industry supposedly added 32,000 jobs in February. Well, they're clearly not picking up, as I've shown from the numbers I just discussed, based on the household survey, they're clearly not picking up the number of people who are losing their jobs in the retail sector from, from, from store closings, from bankruptcies. I mean, Radio Shack is basically shut down. <laughs> yep. yep. That's, that's, that's thousands of people who don't have jobs. And clearly this, sir, this report is not picking that up. Or if it is, they just toss it aside and don't include it in the numbers. So anyway, just R RBS on March the 4th announced that they were going to cut up to 14,000 jobs. Uh, that's inter Wall Street that's international. is losing thousands of jobs. A good friend of mine who works there told me, you're not reading about it, but people are dropping off of Wall Street by the dozens every day. Neighbors industry, an update on March the 3rd, cut nearly 3,500 jobs. So I don't see... I mean that th just those two right there. That's seventeen thousand five hundred jobs. That's just well. Th those are numbers that would theoretically be picked up in March, but they won't be. No. <laughs> no. I mean, we have won't. we have quantifiable numbers, somewhat quantifiable numbers for the amount of people who lost their job in, in January and February, and, and the January and February employment report obviously ignored those. But, uh, don't they use this, Dave, to? manipulate the interest rate also i mean how does how does this tie into with as far as the the payroll numbers and the the this fraudulent lie that is brought to the table every first friday of the month how does that work in tandem 
with what we're seeing this morning as far as the gold and silver market being smashed, as far as this Fed chairman or uh, board member a couple of days ago talking about interest rates uh, being raised. How, how do those work in tandem, or do they? Well, that's a good question. I mean, obviously, this morning, the S&P 500 right now is down almost 20. Um, they, they just they annihilated gold and silver right out of the box. And then in the and the thinking there is it's, it's it's the it's the hedge fund computer programs reacting to the headline numbers and and automatically selling everything because, oh, well, this means they're going to raise interest rates. Well, <laughs> guess what? They're not going to raise interest rates. And the, the Fed is playing this good cop, bad cop game. And part, a big part of the motivation for making people think that the Fed is going to raise interest rates is to provide a prop for the U.S. dollar. Remember, the U.S. dollar is, is the only way, that, is not the only way, but it's, it's the primary way that the U.S. government derives its power. It's how it, it's how it can execute its, and implement its, its program of financial terrorism globally and here domestically. They need, they need a strong dollar and they need the dollar to be the reserve currency for that. So, so they, the, the, Fed, the Fed wants people to think that they might raise interest rates. And one of the, th the two things they've been pointing to are the economic recovery, quote unquote, which we know is a, is a farce, and the inflation rate, which we know is a farce. Well, they just reported a negative inflation rate um, in the latest numbers. Now, obviously, no one believes that. I mean, just, just gasoline alone is in, in my neighborhood has gone up by about 20% in the last two weeks. Yep, yep. same here. And every time I go to the grocery store, I buy the same things as a bachelor. And my and my my the, the amount I pay goes up every single time. I'm not kidding about that. Every time it, I pay more every time. Um, however, during the month of February, um, in early February, the Atlanta Fed president came out and said, "Well, a rate hike is possible for June." Okay, and and then um, a couple weeks later. Um, this guy, James Buller, he's the St. Louis Fed head, said, oh, an interest rate, you know, we got to raise interest rates. We're getting behind the curve. And then a, a, about a week later, uh, the Chicago Fed head, this guy, uh, Evans, Charles Evans, he came out and said, he, I don't want interest rate hikes until early 2016. And then most recently, the Kansas City Fed head, Esther George came out and said, we need to start raising interest rates mid-year. So everyone has this idea in their head that they're going to raise interest rates in June. And, and the guys lobbying for the, these, these regional Fed presidents lobbying for interest rate hikes, they point to affirming employment situation and affirming economy. Well, we know that's nonsense. Or the bottom line too. here is they're not going to raise interest rates. What do you make of uh, China? There was a billboard that showed up in Bangkok, and Simon Black over at uh, Sovereign Man originally posted this uh, photograph that someone took of a billboard that's at the Bangkok airport, and it clearly shows RMB, new choice, and then it says the world currency with a uh, person holding what appears to be a gold coin over a pagoda. Apparently, they have come out and said that they want to China. I'm going to read this. This is from this is from your post, uh, Dave, and I titled it "Is this is this the death nail for the U.S. dollars?" China plans to launch a yuan-denominated gold fix this year to be set through trading on an exchange. Sources familiar with the matter said, as the world's second biggest bullion consumer seeks to gain more say over the pricing of the precious metal. The Chinese benchmark would be derived from a new one kilo contract to be launched on the state-run Shanghai Gold Exchange, a senior source directly involved in the process told Reuters. Now, that is, to me, that is moving in the direction of a gold back yuan, or am I misreading that? 
Well, I mean, that, that's what I'm reading into it. I, I think that China, and remember, China culturally has a really long perspective and a long time frame on how they look at things. You know, they don't, they don't need next quarter's numbers yesterday the way, the way Americans are conditioned and American investors are conditioned. And they, they operate slowly and methodically. And so, you know, obviously any, any gold investor would love to have them come out and, and introduce a gold backed currency yesterday, <laughs> <laughs> but it's not going to happen because it, I mean, for them to do that, it, it would, I mean, I think it would just throw the world into complete chaos. I think they're trying to do this over time gradually in a way that'll, that'll minimize the amount of chaos and, and minim, minimize the political and military fallout that would occur. And I would also argue that this is part of the reason the U.S. Has, has escalated its military provocation of both Russia and China. But having said all that, um, the, the yuan-denominated gold fix is, in my estimation, it's, it's earmarked at directly competing with London's role of, of establishing sort of the global gold, gold fix every day because everyone knows that's completely fraudulent and completely rigged. Well, the, the real physical market has shifted from London to China. London's really just a fractionalized paper market now. But there's actual physical bullion that exchanges hands every day over there. And so they need more of a true price, a true market clearing price. And I think this is a step in the direction of, of um, forcing the market to start evaluating where the price of gold should be based on the actual supply and demand of physical gold, rather than the demand for gold being dictated, or not the demand for gold, but the price of gold being dictated by the amount of paper gold that, that London and New York decide to print up every day and sell to the market to people who are willing to settle for paper gold in their accounts, which is a Western phenomenon, not, not, a, not an Eastern phenomenon. So um, this, this to me is, yes, it'll be a step in the long-term plan they have of rolling out a gold-backed currency. And that's, that's why, obviously, as we all know, why China's been voraciously accumulating as much physical gold as they can. And, and no one knows how much gold the, the People's Bank of China has. But I would I would actually wouldn't be surprised if they have more gold than the Fed reports as having. China is supposed to be making some type of an announcement either in May or June of this year regarding the amount of gold that they have. Don't know. I would question if that how accurate that number will be, but there's supposed to be some type of inkling or some type of, of leak of information, not leak, but an announcement of what they have. And that'll be, that'll be very interesting to, to see what they're willing to share with the rest of the world. Well, I agree. It'll be interesting to see what they report. And again, I, I, as you say, it's not necessarily a number that I would put faith in unless I think for for any government or central bank that reports gold being held I think there needs to be a a publicly visible independent audit that is done in order to verify that what the central bank or the government is claiming is true yes and this is one of the reasons why the Fed is spending millions in lobbying fees fighting the move in Congress to audit the Fed because if they were forced to open up their gold vaults for the public, we'd see the truth. And the Fed does not want us to see the truth. Let's see the gold and let's see the essays that, that say that it is, in fact, you know, what you claim it to be. And let's see the stamps. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Show me the gold. Show me the gold. Well, Dave, well, I can't think of anybody better to have on right now to follow up what we've just been discussing. And that would be Dr. Paul Craig Roberts and allow his wisdom and his knowledge to tie everything together and to lay it bare for our, for our audience. Folks, get ready for a, an amazing, amazing interview.
I thought an interesting angle might be to, to ask you if there's any question that we could ask you that no one ever seems to ask you that you wanted to address. I don't know if that's the case or not, but. Well, you don't have to ask me the question, but when we talk about the China uh, goal one, I think uh, the question that nobody ever thinks about is, uh, why is a reserve currency necessary? And why would China want to be it? So I think the future is likely to be no reserve currency. And um, I think the discipline on countries will be what it's always been. If they overprint the currency, it'll go down. Um, if they maintain the proper kind of relation between money growth and GDP growth, it'll, it'll hold steady. And so I think what will happen is that um, the currencies will simply trade uh, on the market and they'll be used to settle international accounts. There's no real need to have a reserve currency. In fact, Keynes uh, at, at um, uh, well, what was the meeting where they set up the reserve currency? Oh, the Bretton Woods. At Bretton Woods, he came with a proposal that there be no reserve currency, that uh, he had a scheme called Bancor, and it basically, as I remember it, because it's been so long, um, it just consisted of uh, fines if you ran trade deficits or you ran trade deficits of a certain size or percentage. <clears throat> you were fined, and there was no reserve currency. The British didn't want the United States to be the reserve currency because they had been, and they knew how easy it was to reserve, uh, to uh, uh, use that power uh, in the interest of the country that's the reserve currency. And they, did, they knew the United States would exploit this power. So Keynes tried to derail it, but of course the Americans wanted the power. But when you have, uh, when you're the reserve currency, you, you sort of have to run trade deficit in order that the world money supply can grow. Because if your currency becomes the reserve currency, then it's sort of the basis for monetary expansion. And so the country that is the reserve currency, or, or at least this is what they teach in economics, who knows really, <clears throat> has to supply the reserves to the world by running a trade deficit. So whether China wants to do that or not, uh, I don't think they need it. And um, I don't think they have the kinds of ambitions that Washington had after World War II. Um, I don't think their banks necessarily have the ambitions of uh, our big banks to essentially have financial imperialism over the world. So on the, on the payroll of jobs, um, I, I agree totally with what uh, Dave has posted on his site. It's, it's an absurdity <clears throat> when you have a shrinking labor force and you, and you claim <laughs> employment is rising. And the only thing I can add to this is if you look at the claimed jobs, um, only 29,000 of the almost 300,000 claimed jobs are goods producing jobs, so slightly under 10%. And of these, construction accounts for the entirety of the 29,000 goods producing jobs. And of this 29,000 construction jobs, what are called specialty trade contractors. I think they mean home improvements. <laughs> but they account for almost all of the jobs. And so all the, in other words, out of the 29,000 construction jobs, specialty trade contractors account for 27.2,000. So, all the rest are service jobs, of which 70% are accounted for by 
trade, transportation, and utilities, uh, of which retail trade accounts for half. Well, how is there 32,000 new retail trade jobs when there's no retail sales? And then <clears throat> education and health services account for, uh, th that's the second part of the 70%. And half of that is ambulatory health care services, which I think means uh, pushing people in wheelchairs. And then leisure and hospitality is the third element of which waitresses and bartenders account for 58,700 jobs. Well, I just don't see that happening in an economy like us. So these are always the three elements that accounts for the job increases, month after month, year after year. It's always um, uh, retail trade, education, health services, which ambulatory health care is the main component, and waitresses and bartenders. So <clears throat> even if you believe the jobs claimed, they are almost entirely uh, low-wage, domestic, non-tradable services. So this is not, uh, even if you believe the propaganda, it's not in any way you know, impressive. It tells you that the population is becoming a third world workforce. There are no jobs for college graduates. And all of those jobs that you just described, uh, Dr. Roberts, those, of, how, how sustainable are they? How sustainable is that for our economy? Well, if you believe it, um, and, and you take into account that most of these are probably part-time, and that the total jobs is not the number of people working. It, because a lot of those payroll jobs, one person holds two of them, maybe even three. Because I think the part-time percentage of these payroll jobs now is quite high. And so <clears throat> that'd be another statistic we should look at to see what percentage of the, of the new jobs are part-time. I think somewhere they tell you that. So... It, what it tells you is there's no growth in um, consumer income, so the expansion of debt and money by the Fed has not succeeded in driving up wages or consumer demand. And so I think I saw on Zero Hedge this morning a chart showing that the ratio of debt to wages that that debt expansion no longer forces up wages, and wages are now falling even though debt's rising. So clearly it destroys the consumer economy. There's no consumer economy, and since that's what drives this economy, it's consumer spending, it can't possibly be growing. There's not, nothing to drive the growth. What Dave, it doesn't contradict anything Dave said, it just flushes it out. I agree 100% with what you just said about the, the payroll report, and um, I'm glad that you are able to tolerate going through the, the payroll report line by line and dissecting it because it gives me too big of a headache. Um, and that's why I just focused on the, the, the overall macro numbers from the household survey, the growth in, in working age population and the, the macro labor force and labor force participation rate numbers. Because I, I get a headache when I start looking at all this other stuff, and it's like, you, you got to be kidding me. You're telling me there's 29,000 jobs created in construction, and construction spending was down 1.1% last month? Yeah, that, that's, that doesn't add up. And you're telling me there was, thir what was it, 36,000 retail jobs or 32,000 retail jobs? And yet, I mean, yeah. just on Radio Shack alone, there had to have been job losses in the retail industry. Not to mention Target making their announcement yesterday or the day before about laying off, you know, thousands of people. And yeah, that's, and if, that's right. And if you look at the uh, 
um, job losses that BLS reports both January and February for oil is 2,900. Well, Zero Hedge today has a report from Challenger, which seems to be some group that tracks layoffs in the fracking. And there's already reported for January and February 40,000 layoffs, and according to Challenger. And so, yet the BLS this month reports uh, 1,100 and reported a similar small number last month, so that the total for two months they have is less than 3,000 job losses. Well, nobody can believe that with this collapse in the oil price, with the relative high cost of fracking, that nobody's been laid off to speak of. It's not. Okay. Uh, construction spending is down, uh, whatever you said it was. Uh, yet we've got uh, 29,000 more jobs. Uh, we've got all these. Well, first of all, we have the deplorable retail sales at Christmas. Uh, we have the information of declining real consumer incomes, even with the rigged government measure of inflation. Uh, all these closing. So we're, who hired all of these retail clerks? Where'd they come from? Um, I think on the whole, we could put together a piece of kind of went through it like that. There's not too many numbers that are important because most of them are so small, they don't count. If you look at that report, there's only a few places where there's any number of any size. And I gave you the three uh, or four if you count the construction. Um, this report, uh, they managed to come up with about uh, 29,000 college grad jobs. They're sprinkled around computers, engineering, law, architecture, management, accounts. A few here, a few there, a few there, you know what I'm saying? But this is probably all made up as well. But it's still not anything that shows uh, an economy. If you've got only 9%, 9, maybe 10% of the jobs reported in the goods producing sector. And that figure is accounted for by construction. Then you're not making anything. There's really nothing made to export. <laughs> what I just, what I wanted to point out about everything you just said with regard to the employment report is that you mentioned the three or four areas where they reported the most amount of alleged job increases, it also happens to be the areas where it's easiest to put the test to the real world and say those, there's no way those numbers can be even remotely close to what's really going on. I, I wouldn't think. The oil sector, the retail sector, the construction sector, and, and the service sector. I mean, obviously, retail and oil are, 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 are contracting. I mean, you had two months in a row of almost 1% declines in retail sales. I mean, that's almost unheard of. Well, <laughs> they hire more people as the sales decline. <laughs> yeah, that, that makes perfect for business sense, doesn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> Well, guys, I hate to interrupt everything. And Dr. Roberts, I just wanted to thank you for all your time today. It has been a pleasure uh, speaking with you. And, Dave, I will speak with you soon. All right, you guys. All right. Thank you, Dr. Off. Roberts. So long. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.